Network, Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. Over a tired world today, thoughtful men and women who have tried and failed are looking to youth to save the future. In some lands, short-sighted leaders are regimenting youth, exploiting them with deliberate and selfish purpose, heedless that history inevitably repeats itself. It was in America that one of the most selfless and idealistic youth movements the world has ever known was founded. On tonight's Cavalcade of America, we bring you the founder's story, the story of Juliet Lowe, who envisioned and organized the Girl Scouts of America. <laughs> Sure, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play the popular rhythmic melody, and the angels sing. ago, when an American girl attended a fashionable school, she spoke French in all her classes, she walked stiffly from having a backboard fastened to her shoulders, and when she took exercise, it was a demure walk of a few blocks. Such was the training in Mademoiselle Charbonnier's select school for girls. One afternoon, two by two, in bonnets and high-buttoned shoes, they parade down Madison Avenue in New York City, among them a little girl from Savannah, Georgia, Juliet Gordon, called Daisy by her classmates. Marty? Marty? What, Daisy? Dare to turn off at 26th Street? I never take a dare, Daisy Gordon. Oh, you're afraid. I'm not either. But you know we walk only on Madison Avenue. And we look just like a flock of geese. Left, right, left, right, quack, quack. 
Daisy. You better not speak English. Mademoiselle, I'll hear you. Oh, she won't hear you, Daisy. She's back there talking to a dressmaker. Go on, Marty. You're head of a line. Let's turn. Daisy, if you want to turn, you take the head. I'd love to. All right. How many want to walk on Fifth Avenue? Oh, I'm as big as this big. I can die. Eh bien, mes enfants. A gauche. Marchons. Around this corner. Oh, 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 Daisy, you're a brick. Hurry, quick. Mademoiselle didn't see us at all. Let's run. Oh, now, wait a minute. Remember, we're still a little lady. From Mademoiselle Charbonnier select two. So walk down 26, just as if you were home. Oh, isn't it nice to have a change? I wish we could walk fast, Daisy, and get some real exercise. I hate to mince along with little steps. Oh, it's Mademoiselle. Run, girls, run. Oh, she's seen us. Look, at coming. Qui vous a donné la permission de tourner dans cette rue? Mais c'est incroyable. Vous êtes prête, très méchante. It was my idea, Mademoiselle. Juliette. Et pourquoi avez-vous tourné ici? Could I speak English, please? Just what? Mais pourquoi? Well, I just want to ask in good, plain American why we have to walk on Madison Avenue. Ah, so this is it. On Fifth Avenue, there are three times as many young men walking as on Madison. But <laughs> oh, well, we don't speak to boys. We don't even look at them. Oh, I look at them, but not to flirt, mademoiselle. I have 30 cousins down south, and I miss every single one of them. Well, well, you get me girls. One more word from any of you, and I will report this disgraceful matter to the head. We're sorry, mademoiselle. It was really all my fault. Très bien, Juliette. Alors, marchons. Oh, dear. So we have to head right back where we came from. Juliette, toute votre conversation en français, s'il vous plaît. Toujours français. Oui, mademoiselle. Je détest Madison Avenue. <laughs> Juliet Gordon finished her walk that afternoon on Madison Avenue, and when her education was completed, returned to Savannah to become a great belle of the period. So beautiful that when William Lowe, a cotton merchant from England, visited Georgia, he fell in love with her, married her, and took her to London. At first, there were brilliant, charming years of happiness, then swift tragedy, and Juliet Lowe lived alone in the highlands of Scotland. There were occasional friends, one, Sir Robert baden Pole, who had just started the English Boy Scouts. One evening on the terrace of Juliet's lodge. It's beautiful here in the gloaming, Mrs. Lowe. Isn't it? Quiet, so still. I love the highlands, Sir Robert. You'll never find it lonely here. I love the mist and the silence. The heather on the hills. Gives me a comfortable feeling shut away from the world. If you don't mind meddling old men, that's no sort of feeling for a young, charming woman. Why? Because, well, but then it isn't my affair, is it? Go ahead. I don't mind how you scold me. You need some purpose. I had a purpose. When my husband died, I lost it. I don't believe it. Oh, yes. Yes, it's true. I was brought up to be useless. I learned French and didn't mince along a street with ladylike steps. Modern civilization does make people soft. How could you change it? With discipline. That's why I'm starting my Boy Scout movement. I'll give you a Boy Scout manual, Mrs. Lowe. Read it. <laughs> you think it would improve me? I want you to think over my ideas for training the young. What's that? One of my Highland children. Your Highland children? Yes. Yes, if you'll excuse me, I'll walk out and see what she wants. Oh, certainly. Where are you? Mrs. Lowe. Mrs. Lowe. Oh, oh, it's you, Meg. What's the matter, dear? It's my sister. Oh? You mind the one that went to Glasgow to work in the shop? Yes, yes. What's happened to her? She had the fever. And my mother didn't have a cellar to bring her home. Oh, well, here, Meg, take this money. I, I cannot take it. My father had a stick to my Well, I'll talk to your father. You hire a cart for all the way down and bring her home, Meg. Oh, I'll pay it back. I know you will. I, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Lowe. Mrs. Lowe. Yes? Is anything wrong? Oh, it's an outrage. What's the matter? These poor Highland girls, it's a shame they have to work in the Glasgow factories, but they're so poor. They they know nothing of caring for themselves, and many of them die of tuberculosis. These these hills are full of dying girls. I know. Something should be done about the situation. They're too clannish for their own good. I, I... They need somebody to tell them how to do things. Sir Robert... Let me have that Boy Scout manual of yours.
When Juliet Lowe read Baden Powell's Boy Scout manual, she discovered a purpose in life. Organizing the Highland girls into groups, she taught them how to help themselves. And soon her name and work became admired throughout Scotland. Among the girls, there was no better companion. And one day she calls on her little neighbor, Meg, who shows her some chickens. Now, silly hen, will you sit on the nest as you're told? We frightened her, Meg. Brother. Oh, there now. She's <laughs> scattering off to the gorse. We'll build hen houses soon. Can all the girls be here on Saturday? Hi. They're coming from far about. Word's been carried that it's their sport. You wait till they hear how much money we made selling the eggs. <laughs> their eyes will be big as saucers. It's plain now that working together, we've no need ever to leave our homes. Leastways, we don't have to let our young sisters go off to Glasgow. I hope the McNamara's had their wool looms nearly built. With enough woolens on hand, I'm sure I can find a market in London. The girls think you're an angel, Mrs. Lowe. Me? Oh, no. I'm just a woman who's finding out a lot of things late in life. Exciting things, Meg. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Inspired by the enthusiasm of our Highland girls, Juliet Lowe determined to start a national organization for girls in the United States. Returning to America, she talks with the daughters of her friends in Savannah. Mrs. Lowe, tell them how much fun the Scots girls had raising all those chickens and weaving blankets. Those Highland girls made enough to stay with their own families. That's the important thing. Is that what you want us to do, Mrs. Lowe? Raise chickens? <laughs> <laughs> no, Ellen, because there'd be no real reason for you doing it. Every scout troop decides for itself on what it wants for activities. Do you have a basketball team at school? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. But we don't get to play very much. I'd like to play more games. Or oh, English girls play games just like their brothers, don't they? Oh, but that wouldn't be ladylike, Paige. What do you girls think it means to be a lady? Well, you wear a nice dress all the time. You don't play rough games or get dirty. Well, you stay in the house so you'll have a fine complexion when you grow up. Ellen, after your grandfather died, your grandmother ran fairly all by herself, didn't she? My, yes. Ran the plantation and brought up ten children. You suppose she stayed in the house to take care of her complexion? Oh, no. <laughs> I guess she didn't. Indeed, she didn't. Your grandmother was managing a thousand acres. Living outdoors has nothing to do with being a lady. If you're a lady, you'll be one anywhere. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do... You and I will form the first Girl Scout troop in the United States. Mm. Will you do that with me? Oh, yes. I think it would be just wonderful. Don't you, girl? Oh, oh, really? Well, here's you. what we'll do. We'll all meet two or three times first to talk about the Girl Scout laws. And, oh, yes, there's a promise we have to make. A promise? Yes. You say it after me. On my honor, I will try. On my honor... I will try to do my duty to God and my country. To do my duty to God and my country. To help other people at all times. To help other people at all times. To obey the Girl Scout laws. To, to obey the Girl Scout laws. That first small meeting in Savannah, Georgia, Juliet Lowe's Girl Scouts developed so quickly that the movement seemed almost spontaneous. It grew from city to city, state to state, and coast to coast. Juliet began to travel and interest people everywhere in Girl Scouting. Within two years, there was a National Girl Scout headquarters in New York City. Into the offices one day, a gentleman comes to call, finding three young scouts at work. Oh. Uh... Good morning. Oh, good. good morning, mister. Can I help you? Well, is this the national headquarters of the Girl Scouts? Yes, it is, sir. Oh, that's fine. Is Mrs. Lowe here? No, she isn't, mister. Oh, I see. Well, then, perhaps if I dropped in another time? Oh, she'll be back pretty soon, sir. You you can wait if you want to, mister. Well, wouldn't I be in the way? Oh, no. Oh, no, it'll be all right. You could help us lick these stamps. Yes, sure. Uh, would you like to lick some stamps, mister? Oh, yes. Yes, I'd be glad to. Good. Uh, uh, just hand me that pile of envelopes. There. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're, you're sealing them? Yes, sir. Thank you. We're terribly busy today. You uh, have um, 
uh, rapidly developing uh, organization. Oh, uh, what? Uh, your group. Um, you grow fast. You get bigger every day, don't you? Oh, gosh. I mean, my goodness, yes. Over on 3rd Avenue, where Terry and me live, there was only eight kids in our troop at first. Now there's 23. Everybody in the block. Well, that's fine. Now, uh, now I think about it. It's wonderful for city children. Tell me how you first heard... Oh. Oh, oh good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Russell, teacher's colleague. Oh. Mrs. Lowe, this man's licking stamps for us, and he's good at it. Oh, why, Mary, you should make a call and do your work. Well, I'm afraid I've tried to become one of the organizations, Mrs. Oh. Lowe, so without stopping to ask you about it. The young ladies were very pleasant. Well, girls, you've done enough for one morning, and your mothers need you probably. Uh, be careful of street crossings on the way home, won't you? Yes, Mrs. Lowe. Well, I tend to help come up again next week. Next week, same day. I'll expect you. All right. Goodbye, Mary. Goodbye. 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 Uh, Mrs. Lowe, here's what I want to see you about. Our students training to become teachers need to learn, well, a practical program for the leisure hours of children. Oh, please sit down, Dr. Russell. Thank you. I, uh... I really should tell you, Dr. Russell, that our organization itself is having trouble. Having trouble? Yes, financial trouble. Oh, I see. Then we won't bother about my plan until I get some money for you. Get it? How? Mrs. Lowe, I know about your work. And I know something about you. I'm certain there must be men and women in this city who would be glad to help you. Especially right now. And I'm going to make it my business to see what can be done. From that meeting came a concrete financial plan for the further development of Juliet Lowe's Girl Scouts of America. The work grew in cities and towns, until today there are over half a million Girl Scouts. In 1926, the first world encampment was scheduled to be held in the United States. And shortly before it began, Juliet Lowe, ill and tired, was at her home in Savannah, talking with her niece. Aunt Daisy. Yes, dear? Bella says you've asked her to pack your things. I've got to go to New York, dear. Oh, please, Aunt Daisy. You can't go. We won't let you. Who's we? Your family and your doctor. Is that old alarm has been spreading more rumors about me? What did he say? Aunt Daisy, he, he said you must be quiet. What more did he say, dear? What do you mean? How many months? Or weeks? Or is it days? Oh, please, Aunt Daisy. I know what's going to happen, dear. But I don't want to go out with sad looks to remember. I don't see why, when an illness is hopeless and everyone knows it, the doctors don't urge you to cram all the living you can into the last month. <sighs> Just... Think. The first world encampment to be held in America. Oh, darling, it wouldn't do you any good to try to keep me from being there. All right, Aunt Daisy. I won't try. And I don't think the doctor will either. nor physician prevented Juliet Lowe from joining her scouts at their first world encampment. As the chairman addressed the meeting, she waited, ill and tired, outside the big tent. Inside, 500 women waited to hear the words of Chief Scout Sir Robert Baden-Powell. But outside the tent, Baden-Powell speaks first to Juliet Lowe. It's too bad you can't be inside listening to the speeches, Mrs. Lowe. Yes, yes, I'm sorry, too. What do you think of it, Sir Robert? When I look at those tents stretching away for half a mile, when I see the happiness and feel the enthusiasm of American women for scouting, I, I feel like a pygmy beside a giant. <laughs> You've done wonders, and I mean you. I started it, but the rest was easy. Was it so easy? You look very tired, Mrs. Lowe. And I'm getting more rest lately. Oh, I... I think the chairman is finishing her speech. It's, it's time for yours now. So, tomorrow I'll be leaving. I think I'll say my personal goodbye to you now. Uh, since we probably won't be meeting again. No. No, I'm afraid not. Until you come to England. 
Uh, try to make it this summer. My wife and I both hope you'll come. Yes, I'll try to. Sir Robert, yes? it's time for your seat. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes sir. Thank you. I'll go right along. Yes. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, the distinguished founder of the Boy Scouts, Sir Robert baden Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps I could only begin by telling you... And David, don't you want to go out and sit on the platform? No. No, dear. But we can't quite hear the words out here. Well, I know what he's saying. He's saying that he's proud of my American Girl Scout. And so am I. First, I have left no enemies, and I leave and bequeath to my family my friendship, especially my beloved girl, Scout. That was the last testament of Juliet Lowe. But it is to the world that Juliet Lowe really left her girl, Scouts. For from the energy and great faith of the American movement, girl scouting is spread all over the world. In 31 countries, girls make the Scout promise and obey the Scout laws. And five times in the last years... A group of girls from all over the world have gathered for a friendly meeting and interchange of ideas at the Big Girl Scout Chalet in Switzerland. At the close of last year's meeting... What time do we leave for the station, Miss Crandall? At two o'clock, dear. In just a few moments. Girls! Girls! <whistles> girls, when the bus gets here, all of you be sure your duffel bags and valises are right beside you. Is anyone seen Mary Thomas? Mary! Oh, there you are. Hello, Tannis. Oh, my dear, I was so afraid we'd miss each other. I just can't believe we're leaving. Hello, Marie. Hello, Tannis. Voulez-vous me visiter à Paris? Si. C'est possible. I'll have to find out if I can between train time in Paris and sailing for New York, Renee. At least you will see the dinner with my family. Oh, I'd love to if I can. We've had such fun rooming together. I know I shall never forget it. Ni moi non plus. I won't either. Let us kiss and shake hands for the last time. Oh, I am glad we are seeing that song. I am high on the mountain. We found it our chalet. It's golden roof and wine. Just held her up without a care. And each of God and I shall find a welcome there. La. Là-haut sur la montagne, il est un grand chalet. Son large toit penché abritera notre amitié. Pour nous, les éclaireuses, qu'il soit un vrai foyer. To emphasize its international character and to bid youth be friendly in these troubled times, the Girl Scouts are stressing international friendship. At the New York World's Fair, they have a replica of their Swiss chalet. It will be a headquarters for Scouts visiting the fair from everywhere. It will be fair headquarters for more than half a million Girl Scouts of America. It is, in a sense, a memorial and a promise. A memorial to all the courageous pioneers of scouting a memorial to Juliet Lowe, and a promise that the Girl Scouts will continue to stand for the best in young America. And here's Basil Rysdale speaking for the DuPont Company and bringing us another story from the wonder world of chemistry. Some of the things in the DuPont Wonder World of Chemistry exhibits at the New York and San Francisco World's Fairs are so remarkable, they almost defy description. 
Have you ever heard of piped light? Yes, piped light. That's one way of describing an amazing characteristic of lucite plastic, the crystal clear material that DuPont chemists developed not long ago after years of research. A solid rod of lucite looks like a glass rod, such as you see to hang towels on. But unlike glass, lucite has the peculiar optical property of transmitting light right down the whole length of the rod and out the far end. Hold the light at one end, and it shines out at the other. Now take the lucite rod and bend it into curves, or like a corkscrew. What happens? The light still shines brightly at the far end. And here's the explanation. When light rays travel in lucite, they can't penetrate the outside wall. Instead, they bounce along by reflection until they escape at the end, turning corners as easy as anything. However, by cutting or grinding the surface of the rod, light can be made to come out wherever you wish. Well, what can be done with light that bends around corners? Already it's turned out to be a great help to surgeons and dentists. A number of surgical instruments are being made of lucite plastic, with electric bulbs in the handles. Thus, light can be directed right to the spot where it's needed. And the wonder doesn't end there, because the light is cold. This elimination of heat is important to the patient's comfort. Let's take a simple example. A tongue depressor with light coming out at the end. Surely you've had a doctor examine your throat using a flat wooden stick for a tongue depressor. And you probably remember the difficulty he had in getting light way back into your mouth with a flashlight or mirror. The new lucite instrument focuses a white, brilliant light right on the spot where he needs it and holds down your tongue at the same time. Time alone will tell what further use may be made of rays of cool light piped through lucite plastic. Meanwhile, medical men have thought of another clever use for this wonder of chemistry. Because the material weighs so little, properly shaped pieces of lucite are used with amplifying devices to aid the heart of hearing. The small plastic pieces fit snugly and comfortably into the ear to hold the miniature receivers of hearing instruments. Yes, indeed. When the research chemist gives the world a new material, you never can tell how many good things it will do for mankind. Like many other marvels in the wonder world of chemistry exhibits at the world's fairs, lucite plastic well illustrates the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Cavalcade of America presents the story of a man regarded as the greatest single force in the broad development of American law, the late Oliver Wendell Holmes, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. On tonight's program, the part of Juliet Lowe was played by Agnes Moorhead. Until next week, then, at the same time, this is Thomas Chalmers saying good night and best wishes from New Park. <laughs> This is a Columbia Broadcasting System.